So today <clears throat> we're going to start um, causality, correlation, randomness, probability. And let me check the schedule real quick. I think I scheduled this to have two class meetings. Um, not because it's particularly hard, but there's a lot to try to cover. So let me check that. Yeah, 17 causality. Oh, I'm so it's one class meeting, but these are going to bleed into each other. The causality and simulation. The lesson link is active. Today's lab is active. Today's exercise is active. Now the upload for those is not put there yet. That's going to happen during the actual lab. So you have to access the lab either through the syllabus or through the class notes. Okay, so we're now making a fundamental change in mindset over what we've done so far. All the background material is essentially out of the way. You have all the tools you need, and now we're going to use this to do some computational thinking and data science because that's in the title of the class. So today we'll discuss the concept of causality and correlation in a comparison and contrasting sense and a little bit on randomness. And our objectives are to understand the various concepts in these, understand how we're gonna use them in simulation and apply them using iteration. So brings up the question, what is causality? So you could go on the mighty internet and get all sorts of mighty definitions of causality. And if you're not particularly careful, you'll end up in the physics world of causality talking about how things occur in space and time in closed time loops. That's not really what we mean, but we'll read some of it just because it's fun. Causality is the relationship between cause and effect. Okay, so for instance, if your letter grade in this class was determined entirely by showing up here three days a week, me checking your, your by your name, you earned a D in the class, the cause would be is you didn't show up all 44 times. That's a cause and effect. No show, no value. That's not the case uh, in this particular class. Showing up matters, but it's not going to, that alone is not going to make a difference in, in the vowel or consonant that you get in the semester. That is an example of causality. What other examples of causality can you think of in your daily life? Heavy traffic, light turns red, you step on the accelerator. What's likely to happen in that case? That's not like the movies. The movies, you, you end up getting through all the other cars, but in real life, you team up somebody going through the intersection. The effect is the crash, the cause is failing to respond to the red light. That's cause effect as, as meant here. Now to get into physicists and a little bit of a theology, um, it's generally believed causality cannot occur between an effect and an effect that has not occurred in the past uh, light cone of said effect. Similarly, cause could not have effect outside its future light cone. And if you wanna read about that, here's some articles on closed time loops. Uh, this is pretty fun reading. I guess you have to be weird to find it fun. The second paper is written by a contemporary yourself. So some undergraduate students probably sitting in a boring ass class like this and then decided to research it. It's actually a fairly fundamental paper. I'm sure the, uh, their, his professors, his or her professors are uh, somewhat upset that they were snookered by one of their own students, but that's, that's cool. Um, so the talk of closed time loops and causality and effect, basically I'm making the pitch that time travel as we perceive it in the movies is probably not possible. Let's find out. If the time machine's invented, I'm gonna come through that door in about 30 seconds. 
healing is probably the big thing in the point. At least in my uh, light cone, it has not been invented yet. Okay, so causality in this context, this time loop thing should not be confused with Newton's second law, which is related to conservation momentum and is a consequence of spatial homogeneity of physics. Um, so that running the red light and T-boning the traffic in a busy intersection, that's cause in the Newtonian sense. You have physics playing its role against you. Is it going to do that blinky thing the whole time? Probably. Okay, so yada yada blah blah blah. It's the rest. And you can read this on your own. The um, these two links are worth taking a look at, even if you have no interest whatsoever in furthering your own knowledge. It's still worth uh, taking a look at. And they're not funny. They're just uh, current dogma on on cause, effect, and time. Um, let's look at a mimic of cause, which is called correlation. First, here's how you can tell if you're discussing causality. If you take the literary, the literary construct of causality in the structure of why, because, that is causation, it's sort of like if then. Uh, if you have a question it's a because question. The answer to that because question is the cause. Uh, a lot of people use the word since, and probably you all do, and I'm sure I've done it myself. Since you didn't pay me the money, I'm not giving you the stuff. That's the incorrect use of the word since. Since always deals with time. So since I didn't pay you last week, you're now stealing my house. Now that is correct use of the word since. But you didn't pay because you didn't pay me. You're not getting your car back. That is cause effect. Now correlation is related, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Correlation doesn't mean that cause has occurred, although it's a really good predictor of the crap that we buy on Amazon. So let's imagine this chart below to try to motivate this idea of correlation and cause. So the blue. Markers represent the American Bar Association lawyers nationally, and the orange markers represent the money spent on pets in the United States. So if the fact that it's in years is kind of a complex, but as the money spent on pets goes up, what does that chart tell you about the number? It also goes up. Therefore, it's clear that spending money on pets causes lawyers. Um, someone's shaking their head. No, that's the correct thing. It's that's absurd. For one thing, lawyers don't even like animals. They barely like each other. The only thing in the planet they like is the great white shark. And that's out of professional courtesy. So. Um, the dollar spent on pets causing lawyers is ridiculous. There is no cause effect there. Similarly, the opposite, the more lawyers you have, the more money gets spent on pets. There's no direct cause there whatsoever. Again, because lawyers don't actually spend their own money. They use opium, other people's money. Not to be confused with the uh, medication. They probably use that too. So, what this chart is showing us is probably the generalized socioeconomic conditions that, that, that create accumulation of wealth and create disposable income, allows people to have pets, in this case, companion animals, not meals ready to eat that meow and bark, also creates conditions for lawyers to proliferate. Hence, there's a strong correlation. That's the difference between correlation and cause. There's, there's a lot of other classical examples. This one was just the coolest because everybody likes pets. And even if you're from a family of lawyers, no one really likes lawyers. Or perhaps there's too many of them. Um, let's look at some other just word examples. This is taken from a uh, publication by the United States Geologic Survey. 
also known as measure the fake walls. Measure everything. Things, things don't need to be measured. Uh, and that's how we know how much natural resources we have and whether or not we need to go to other countries and take theirs. So for instance, concentrations of atrazine, which is a um, type of pesticide and nitrate, which is a <coughs> type of fertilizer in shallow groundwater are measured in wells over a several county area. For each sample, the concentration of one is plotted versus the concentration of the other. So atrazine versus nitrate. What kind of plot can you just describe in words? A scatter plot. Excellent. Probably says that somewhere here anyway, but we'll, we'll go with the, you, you dream that up all by yourself, no help. Cool. Um, as atrazine concentrations increase, so does nitrate. So the question is, does atrazine cause nitrate? Probably not. Why does atrazine nitrate increase proportionately? Double atrazine is just an increase in nitrate. Well, knowing what the two components are uh, is a better uh, solution. If nitrate is a type of fertilizer, generally fertilizing stuff to grow marijuana, job on California, you don't want the marijuana bug deal. So you put atrazine on paraquat and other stuff to help enhance its uh, effect on your lungs. Kidding about the marijuana, but the rest is, is, a, is a plausible story. So because they are used in conjunction, because pesticides and fertilizers are used side by side, it makes, there is some sense that they would, uh, they would both uh, be associated. And then the, uh, the more statistical or data science question is, how do we assess the strength of that association? We'll get to that. Second example, streams draining the Sierra Nevada mountains, California, usually receive less precipitation in November than other months. This year being a notable uh, exception, that precipitation stuff, they've, they've actually removed the word from the California dictionary. There is no such thing as rain, all there is is drought and more drought um, and fire. Has the amount of November precipitation significantly changed over the last 70 years, showing a gradual change in the climate of the area? How might you test that conjecture? Pretend <clears throat> that we can get data as to the snow. What would we, uh, what would we want to have data on? What is the precipitation? Okay, so we have precipitation and get it for each month. How many years is it be one? 70. At least 70. Yeah, so we can go back in time. And then the next question, how do you tell if there's a change? First, how do we tell if November is different than the other 11 months? You did it on the exam, most of you got it right. Duh, yeah. Go ahead and put it in data frame and see if the mean values are substantially different for November than the other 11 months. It's telling us what our conjecture is, less than the other 11 months. So the mean of most of the other months is maybe 10 inches and November is three inches. Is that a strong indicator that Maybe that statement uh, has some plausibility. That'd be a yes. And then the um, next question is, has it changed over 70 years? How do you assess that question? You can plot it. Got to plot it. You can plot it. That would actually be a good starting point. What would you expect that plot to look like if it was indeed a change in precipitation over 70 years? Went that way. We implied that it was sloping down, downward with respect to the increase in here. Good. See, you guys can do data science. You don't need to sit there bored out of your mind. Um, 
So good, we've, we've dealt with that second one. So the, these two situations above require a couple of things. We're trying to measure how strong two variables are associated with one another, such as the chemical concentrations or precip in time, and how do they co-vary. One class of measures that does this are called correlation coefficients. Also of great importance is how the significance of the association can be tested for to determine whether the observed pattern differs from what it, what's expected due entirely to chance. So is that downward slope for November explainable because the change appears to be real or is it just random behavior. So to answer that, we actually got to talk about randomness. But first, but wait, there's more. Whenever we make a correlation calculation, we should always plot the data. It says here on a scatter plot, but if you don't like scatter plots, at least do a line plot. Um, no single numerical measure can substitute for the visual clue that's gained from the plot. Of course, if you plot the wrong stuff, I guess it doesn't really matter. There's a lot of different patterns that can produce identical correlation coefficient numbers. And similar strengths of relationship can produce different coefficients depending on the curvature in the relationship. The example, I don't have it to be able to create it in the computer, but um, so this covariance equation. You create a scatter plot of that basically plots in the circle. Possible to get a correlation coefficient of one, which means very well correlated, but it's only valid inside the circle. So either edge of it doesn't work. That's an example of without the plot, you never know that. You say, oh, my correlation coefficient is one. I got a perfect model. I can't keep using it. And before you know it, you will have made your money into Bitcoin. It'd be like having that account and someone skims from you. So first, let's look at uh, covariance. So covariance is something that you'll learn more about in statistics. Um, it's really a, uh, a value of two variables that may be random. Uh, the first one is x, second one is y. And we're taking all the values of x minus their mean, storing up that series, all the values of y minus their mean, storing up that series, multiplying each one, adding the whole thing up and dividing by n minus one. And that is the, called the covariance of x and y. So if we had the covariance of x and x, which is a perfectly definable thing, what's that known as? The formula is sum of x minus x bar times x minus x bar times x minus x bar squared over n minus one. You know that is something. Damn close. It's called that. It's good. The square root of it is the standard deviation. So if if greater values of one variable mainly correspond to greater values of the other variable, uh, and the same holds true for lesser values, then the uh, covariance will be positive. That's kind of like the sloping up picture. If the opposite is true, the sloping down picture. So in the case of the November precipitation, if the variables we were covariating were precipitation in year, which is kind of misused in class, it's good enough for you. We would have a negative covariance that we would expect to obtain if we had the downward slope as precipitation was decreasing over time. And just because we have a negative covariance, it's simply indicating that the slope is probably downward. We still have no guarantee if it's statistically significant, but that's another story. Um, if there is no relationship, the covariance values are pretty close to zero. So here's a cartoon um, kind of indicating that. So covariance alone is not necessarily correlation, but it leads us into it. So let me get everything set up. So here we go. So we have a positive correlation on the left, 
zero correlation in the middle, negative correlation on the right. So in our November precipitation, which of the three pictures make the most sense? Yeah, the one on the, the right most one. What if we change the middle one with our scattered point? See what that's really telling us. Telling us if we know the value on the x-axis, what does it tell us about the y-axis? Not very much. If, the, if we put bigger on the x-axis, we have no idea if y is going to be bigger or small. We do know it's going to be contained in that range of the dots. That's about it. How would you characterize the range of the dots? The mean, the standard deviation, that's all you know about it. It's the mean correlation. Uh, let's look at the positive correlation, the leftmost picture. If, if we increase the value of our x, what do we expect the y variable? Also increased and proportionally to the slope of the line. Cool. So the correlation coefficient is a measure of how strong that relationship is between two variables. There's a, there's a bunch of types of correlation coefficients, but the most popular is Pearson's. Uh, Pearson's correlation, also called Pearson's R, is a correlation coefficient. It's commonly used in linear regression. And, and the formulas are used to find how strong a relationship is between data. So the formula for Pearson's is listed up here. It looks more complicated than it really is. So it certainly, if you look at that carefully, you can see that there are aspects of covariance in it. There's certainly a covariance right there. These are just to apply it as written. So presumably we can, script up that formula all by ourselves. By now you know how. If you needed to compute Pearson's R and you couldn't find a package that already does it for you, how would you do it? Make a function? What would the arguments to that function be? What would be the inputs? X, Y, N. Um, actually, we need to supply N. We need to supply the list X. We need to supply the list Y. By default, they have to be the same length. You can't compute the coefficient. You count them, say so the link function, and you do one of the input the actually code, verify that they are the same length, and then on the indicator. So this actually would be a very simple program to pass for anyone in this room that's still awake. And the correlation coefficient produces a value between minus one and one. And again, if you recall the previous picture with the green dots, it's, it's, it's essentially conveying the same information, only in this case with black dots and blue lines, because naturally the uh, figure was lifted from somewhere else. So let's go to the middle one, the zero one. It, there's no information provided by this relationship. So that means that those two variables are, for all practical purposes, aren't correlated College of X doesn't tell you much about Y. College of Y doesn't tell you much about X. The best <coughs> we can do there is that for any X, you could just you could just safely take <coughs> the mean. It's going to be one of those days. The mean value of Y. Um, here we have a positive correlation, and the correlation coefficient not only is implying a positive slope, it also is conveying some information on how tight are about that loop. Oh, somebody left me something to blow my brain down. Must be that COVID again. <clears throat> and we have the written terms up here. Correlation coefficient of one means that for every positive increase in one variable, 
there's a positive increase of known proportion to the other one. Negative one, same story, but going downward, zero means there's not much information. So let's look at a simple example because that uh, has some aspect. We're going to recover our recall our time and speed. Um, this is from earlier in the class. We've seen these before. So we have time as one list, speed is another list. If you recall, we put straight lines through it. We put curved lines through it. We pulled it out of our datum and just guessed at it. Um, let's see how correlated the two are. So first thing we can do, just looking at the table, as time increases, what does speed do? do? It also increases. So there is, at least an intrinsic relationship, more time, more speed. That should be a Breaking Bad episode. Um, let's go ahead and just do it with numbers. So we'll load our necessary packages. In this case, we'll have our friends NumPy, Pandas, and we're going to pull in a package called statistics. And that's so that we don't actually have to write code to get Pearson's R and some other things. There's no reason not to write code, except if somebody else has already done it, it's on the mighty internet. Why not use it? Someone give me a good reason why not use it. See, so you can. So we'll just use someone else's. Bearing in mind that if it doesn't work right, we have to do it ourselves. So there is our data frame called PD, time, and speed. We can explore the data using the describe function. So what do we learn from the describe function? Well, the average value of time is five units. The average value of speed is 43 units, the smallest time and speed are zero respectively. The biggest time is 10 and the biggest speed is 121. The median value of time is five, the median value of speed is 30, and we have a 25 70 percentile. Other than getting numbers out of the described function, in this particular instance, those characterizations aren't terribly useful. Standard deviation speed is nearly more than 10 times bigger than the standard deviation of time. So again, just from the numbers, there's not, not much to be learned there. Let's go ahead and use our statistics tools and uh, get the variance of time, the variance of speed. You'll discover that it's the square of those two numbers. So uh, the variance of times is 11. The variance of speed is almost 1,700 and ask ourselves, is there evidence of a relationship between time and speed? So first, let's just find the covariance. Remember the covariance function? We could have done that ourselves, but because we have a statistic package, we just How did I get it into data? That so it looks like I'm missing a line. Oh, I, so the data frame is named data. That was a bad decision on my part. Okay, so we'll take the covariance of the data frame. And we find that the uh, covariance of time with time is 11. It makes sense because I already said earlier that the covariance of a variable with itself is called the variance which is the same value as the The covariance of speed and speed is almost 1,700. Again, the same statement. Um, but the covariance of time and speed is 131. So it's certainly bigger than the variance of time um, and smaller than the variance of speed. So because it's non zero, it's kind of a, and, and pretty strongly positive, kind of an indication that there's something going on. Let's find the correlation along the columns using the Pearson um, method. So the function is called core. The method is Pearson. And now we have the correlation coefficient of time to time is one. Does that make sense? Yeah, the variable should be correlated with itself perfectly. Correlation coefficient of 
the speed of the speed is also one because it's variable correlated with itself. It should be perfect. And the correlation of speed with time at 0.96 is the correlation of time to speed with multiple. It's always a symmetrical control. That's bigger than zero, so there is a correlation there. It's positive, but it's pretty darn close to one. So there is evidence that there is a strong correlation between time and speed. Oh, actually, that's what it says there in typed words. Um, with that, we could actually kind of hack together a pretty usable linear model and simply state that speed is equal to the average speed plus the covariance of speed and time divided by the covariance of time and time multiplied by t minus the average value of time. So let's go ahead and we'll build that function and we'll assess it by <coughs> plotting. So here's our model, speed, take the mean plus time minus time mean times data covariance and pull the correct values out of the matrix. And then we'll go ahead and plot it. And there is our plot. Now let's look at, we've made plots like that before. How much trial and error occurred this time? That'd be nice. Tested for a correlation. There was one we just used correlation coefficient to recover a slope. That was perceptive, so we were set to zero. And that's not a bad first model. In fact, that's how most of the regression models actually So that was a lot easier in trial and error, don't you think? I think so. So some of the implications. So most research questions, uh, does time cause speed? Is there a causation there? We don't know exactly. So keeping that in mind, let's move on. Now, certainly something else, force causes speed. If we had a way to do that with force and speed and time, then we could probably find causation. But time itself is just a measure of time. Okay, most research questions are aimed at explaining cause and effect. If it's experimental, the relationships constructed in the experiment is somewhat a failure if none of the presumed causes uh, influence the response. In data science, causality might be impossible to establish, such as time and speed. However, correlations can be established and exploited. So in data science, many studies involve observations on groups of individuals like yourselves, a factor of interest called a treatment or an explanatory variable or a predictor variable or a predictor feature, a whole bunch of terminology for it, and an outcome response, effect, state, predict, value, and so forth, measure on each individual. For presumptive establishment of causality takes places in two stages. First, an association is observed. You fail to attend class, you get really lousy scores on homeworks. Uh, then in relation between the treatment and the outcome is called an association. We can measure that strength using correlation coefficients, which is actually why it was introduced at this point. Secondly, a more careful analysis used to establish causality. That's a nice way of saying you go to the boss and say we need more money. One approach is to control all variables other than the suspected explanatory variables, which for any meaningful process is essentially impossible. So don't believe the TV commercials about the uh, at-home tests that can tell you which peanut is allergic to. And it's all probably potentially useful for a handful of individuals on the planet. But, but generally there's too many other variables to control for because you'd have to wrap the patient in bubble wrap and then chain their ankle to uh, uh, bolt that's cemented into the floor so they can't get more than a foot away from their easy chair, provide a large uh, bucket so they can excrete food while you're testing them. 
it's just not controllable. And that's medical research, which has all the money on the planet to do stuff. Imagine engineering stuff where we don't quite spend that kind of money. Um, another approach is to do randomized studies. And so the idea here is we would start with a sample from a population. So for example, volunteers to test COVID-19 vaccine. And that was actually a very huge volunteer pool. I believe seven or eight billion people, most of the, but half of the planet uh, volunteered, possibly um, unwillingly, but anyway, it's, it's kind of fun and get to talk about stuff like that. And then you randomly sign members to either the control group or the treatment group. The control group gets the, probably the most powerful medication that's ever been invented called placebo and, or placebo. And the treatment group gets the actual medication. And then you expose the two groups ident identically and then compare the responses of the two groups. So that's, that's medical research, but it also applies to biological research. We actually also do a variation of that in engineering research. So the key thing to pull out of here is not that I'm making fun of COVID-19 vaccine, but that you break your target population into three categories. If you don't tell them, it's called blind study. If you have to tell them then you blind them, so you can still do Study. And one group gets a fake treatment, the other group gets the actual treatment, and then you observe the response. So the group that gets the fake treatment, the group that gets the actual treatment, have identical responses. What can you say about that treatment? Doesn't appear to do well, assuming there's no benefit. The treatment is no different than the control. It has no added value. There's no information. Um, and then we could do that repeatedly and at some point be able to uh, infer the possibility of causation. So here's just a picture example. So this is actual real data from the uh, mighty internet from the MMWR, which means Morbidity, mortality, weekly report. And they break it down by state. So this is for Texas. This is from 2009 and 10. And the virus surveillance system. And we got this big old scary spike here of influenza type A starting at the end of August and going pretty much to the beginning of December. So see what's going on there. What happens at the end of August to the beginning of December? Yeah, so you got all those infected vectors that have been sent home all summer. They get together in school and they start swapping spit and whatever they do to uh, share the virus. And it rages and rages and it's almost Christmas time. So plummets. And uh, that pattern is repeated regardless of whether it's H1N1 or the type A not subtype. And then this black line is just a percent positive. And actually you got, you got pretty good uh, percent positive during the summertime, but it plummets right before Christmas. And then Apple announces a new iPhone and it goes up again so that everyone can stay at home and learn how to use it. So the kind of questions that a chart like this might motivate. Does going to school cost influenza? What do you all think? Because you've been going to school, I'd say a lot longer than I have, but I guess technically I never left school. So. I think that's getting down there to a maybe question. Um, does, does influenza cause school attendance? No. Does going to school contribute to the spread of flu? That's what that's what uh, she said. Um, probably does. There's probably that chart alone is not evidence of it, but there probably is evidence that you can extract from surveillance data. Does 
Does the spread of influenza contribute to school attendance? Yeah, and then nobody wants to see people at home, so they cut them off at school. You can still walk and go to school. Are there other variables that affect both? That's the most important question up there on the list. <laughs> Certainly there are. Depends on what community you're in. It depends on where in the world you are. If we're in Siberia, where it's cold all the time, except when it isn't, um, that's certainly going to have an impact. Those other variables are called confounding factors or lurking variables. Um, I don't like the word lurking variables because as a sewage engineer, a lurker is a particular type of sewage. You got your floaters, your sinkers, and your lurkers. The lurkers are the ones that break stuff erect pumps and so forth. So let's go with what confounding factors are. Uh, any underlying difference between the two groups is called a confounding factor because it might confound you uh, when you try to reach a conclusion. For example, cold weather in the previous example might be a confounding factor. Uh, confounding factors also occur when explanatory variables are correlated to one another. For instance, flood flows are well correlated to drainage area, main channel length, mean annual precipitation, main channel slope, and elevation. We can't predict it, but there's very strong correlations. Uh, it turns out that main channel length is also strongly correlated to drainage area. In fact, they're almost a, it's almost the square root of it. Uh, so much as to be useless if it's retained in a data prediction. Either use area or main channel length. That's an example of a confounding variable. So in our example with time predicting speed, although there is no causation there whatsoever, but we might discover that time squared is also has a very strong correlation. Well, time and time squared are kind of correlated to one another. For example, one's the square of the other. You wouldn't want to retain both of those as predictor variables, because you'd be double counting at that point. Your, your data model wouldn't be very good at identifying causation. And I got two minutes left, so let's go to randomization. To establish causality in data science experiments, we need to be able to randomize stuff. Uh, we have our friends Python that can make pseudo random choices. There's built in functions in NumPy under the random submodule, one of them is the choice function, which randomly picks one item from an array. The syntax is numpy random choice array name. Uh, as an example, um, we could create an array that has two elements. One's called treatment, the other's called control. So the type of data that's in the numpy array in the treatment control, what are the data types? Yes, there's a string. A string called treatment, a string called control. And if for some reason we wanted to uh, sample from that, uh, that array called two groups, use the random choice and tell the random choice function go to the two groups away array and randomly sample one thing from it. Get back, we can get back control. Do that over and over and over. So it's like a repeat sample. You come up with an entire collection of controls and treatments that would be randomized from the standpoint of how they'll how they appear. We a random list of two possible outcomes, but random. And we can use that to help design experiments. Let's do a more uh, succinct example. Let's imagine that we want to play dice but we don't have, um, we want to do it on the computer in class because class is boring. So you're going to come up with a gambling uh, tool. So we'll make our array containing one, two, three, four, five, and six as strings, and we'll call it my die. And then we will choose from my die, which is essentially rolling it. So if we roll it once, we get a one. If we roll it again, we get a four. Another time we get a two, four, five, four, two. 
And so now we have a tool that's randomly selecting values from the my dime. That's a very powerful tool that we can use in Notify. Okay, y'all get Nancy because I guess there's lab in eight minutes, and so I will I will stop right now. Have a great day and see you in lab shortly. <laughs>